And welcome, everyone. We're so grateful to have so many of you joining us from different parts of the world again for another one of our fabulous seaweed sessions. This afternoon's session is Integrating Seaweed into Visual Art with Rob Ferrier. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Rob. He's a Vancouver Island-based visual artist who specializes in integrating dried walking stick kelp with ceramic pottery. His unique one-of-a-kind productions capture the graceful ebb and flow of this type of seaweed in its underwater setting. It's inspiring one to reflect, sorry, on the powerful natural forces that consistently shape the marine environment. So Rob's gonna join us this afternoon. And although you're not on camera with us this afternoon, our audience, and we do have you on mute, we do invite you if you have any questions at all as we go throughout the session, anything that you'd like to know and you'd like to ask Rob, please pop those in the chat box. And we'll send, if you could send those to the host, chat those, put those in the chat box. And we'll ask your questions throughout the presentation this afternoon. And we'll get to as many as we can for sure. Rob's gonna join us now. And then we have a little video to share with you just to tell you a little bit um, about Rob and his story. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Nice We're so you. glad to have you here this afternoon. And I can see you have a couple of beautiful pieces behind you. Thank and you. I'm happy to say that I have, I don't know if everyone can see that, I have a beautiful piece as well. Um, in the office too. So we're going to um, show the video that you um, created for us. And if everyone would like to watch that for a few minutes, you'll get to know a little bit about Rob and the beautiful work that he does. And then we'll pop back. In Victoria, British Columbia, on the southernmost tip of Vancouver Island in the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. In my time scuba diving here in the Pacific Ocean, I became inspired seeing the kelp's beautiful, rhythmic, almost seamless movements as it ebbs and flows amid the endlessly churning water. Initially, it seemed to me that this natural underwater beauty was privy only to scuba enthusiasts who descend under the sea and that its visceral imagery could not be effectively replicated beyond the use of underwater photography. Well, walking along a secluded stretch of shoreline on southern Vancouver Island, I noticed walking stick kelp strewn all along the seashore. Like some other form of seaweed, it naturally releases itself from the ocean floor and eventually makes its way onto the upper section of the beach known as the spray zone. The spray zone is more a part of the land than the ocean. It is submerged only at very high tide events or during severe storms, but it is repeatedly dampened by splashing waves and literally windblown spray. This specific zone creates an ideal setting where the seaweed can dry very slowly in the sunlight and in a manner that reflects its previous underwater marine environment. It eventually becomes as solid as hardwood, and that is the product that I harvest. My personal form of expression manifests itself in visual art pieces comprised of walking stick kelp and repurposed ceramic pottery. It is a mixed media form of art that combines different components to form what is ideally a harmonious and aesthetically pleasing final product. Walking stick kelp, also known as Terra Gophera californica, 
is a very unique medium to work with that grows throughout much of the Pacific Ocean's coastal regions. During the underwater or immersed portion of its life cycle, it stays fastened to the seafloor, its leafy stems reaching upward through the depths to collect as much sunlight as possible. Walking stick kelp assumes a place of great importance in terms of intertidal and nearshore ecosystems. It is directly pertinent to natural processes such as energy capture, energy transfer, and nutrient cycling. And it also provides a three-dimensional habitat and defensive setting for a vast array of marine plants and animals. My parents are hardworking people who instilled creativity in their children from a young age. My mother exposed us to a wide range of art. As an accomplished woodworker, my father has always been very tactile and hands-on in terms of his creativity, involving us children in his crafting of wooden sculptures, furniture, and a wide range of interesting items. To harvest the seaweed specimens, which I do several times a year, I travel to select locations on southern Vancouver Island. These journeys are actually very important to me as I often involve my children so I can try and instill in them not only an appreciation of the creative process but also of the symbiotic interconnectedness of all things. After collecting the kelp specimens I also gather an assortment of rocks from the shoreline various sizes, colors, shapes and so on. These rocks are then used to accentuate the base portion of each piece, giving them an aesthetic whereby they reflect the colorful seabed setting from which the kelp actually sprouts and reaches up towards the surface. For the ceramics, I use locally sourced repurposed materials that have a distinct character and integrate harmoniously with the kelp and the rocks. Creating the pieces takes considerable time and effort. It is a delicate and labor-intensive process that requires very good preparation and planning. Every piece is completely unique in its own right. I start with building a vision of exactly how I want it to look, and then I go about choosing the materials in a purposeful manner. From the shape and size of the seaweed, to the myriad of colors reflected in the rocks, to the patterns and style of the ceramics. Each piece has a distinct identity. What a beautiful introduction to your work and your beautiful art. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Yeah. Can you share um, a little bit more about the work that you do in the art that you create? I would be interested to know how long you've been doing this. You know, it's been probably about uh, six years. Um, it, initially, it started, like most things, as an idea, and I uh, reflected on it quite a bit uh, in terms of how I could Again, as the video said, um, capture that manifestation of how seaweed is in its natural environment, setting under the water, which is a challenge, obviously. But um, eventually, I, I achieved that concept of integrating with the ceramics and um, the rocks and the seashells and that. Um, I try to make every piece unique, as I said before. But um, that's a lot of fun, actually, because I do do a lot of custom pieces that are that people come to me and ask them they have a, a vision in mind they say I have a space on my patio or a window and they they have their own vision and then I try to interpret that and build the seaweed into that concept so does that mean a fair amount of your work is commissioned yeah yeah I would say so oh yeah, but at okay. the same time I do a lot of it um, organically by myself when I feel the inspiration I do it quite a bit usually every weekend um, when I stumble, you know, across a ceramic that I'm particularly inspired by, that, that's often a catalyst. 
We have a couple of people asking if this is a hobby, a passion, or your regular day job. It's not my regular day job. Um, it's definitely a passion and a hobby. And um, I'll be honest with you, the more I do it, the, I, I find it just very uh, invigorating and it puts me in a really good space. I, I just, I really enjoy it. One of the things I heard in the video was you mentioned that you go out foraging several times a several times a year. Can you talk a little bit about more about that as opposed to like going out even more often than that? Is there a reason why at certain times of the year? Well, um, I think it mentioned in the video. There's a lot of uh, when the storms churn up and the seaweed releases from the seabed. That's a seasonal event, largely, and it's usually uh, probably several weeks after that when the high tides occur and the splash zone is sort of inundated with the seaweed that it gets a, a chance to dry it, uh, there's a certain sweet spot with knowing it, I find to be honest with you it's usually in the spring early spring and um, late summer is pretty good too but you know it's a lot of it is finding the right beach not necessarily any beach okay here's an interesting question did seaweed as a medium choose you or did you choose seaweed you know I I think it's a bit of both but I would lean towards the seaweed to be honest with you because uh there's one you'll see this one that's right behind me the green and linda we mentioned about we talked about this before but that was the very first one i did and um, i'm very attached to it because i was at a, a beach out past souk and i came across that when i was walking along and i just thought this is the most unique piece of nature that i've seen in a long time and i, I just i kept it and you know looked at it for a few days and tried to figure out how I can integrate it with some of my sort of my artistic meanings. And eventually I came up with, um, you know, I saw that vase and the colors seemed to strike me in a certain way. And um, that's, that's where it started really. Okay. And, and I was interested to know, you talked about repurposing pottery. So where, where do you find those pieces? You know, there's, Victoria is wonderful. I mean, the island's wonderful in many ways. Um, it, first, uh, second hand stores and things like that. Um, there's a lot of repurposing going on generally. And uh, I've, I've got several places, uh, vendors I, I'll go to that they, they rotate their stock quite a bit. They, they get a lot of really unique designs um, that a lot of people would probably pass by. But for my unique purpose, I find them quite regularly uh, in my little journeys around town. Okay. Wow. So many good questions coming in. Do you have a preference in doing larger pieces or smaller? Um, it's funny you ask that because yesterday I finished a large piece and the large pieces are, are, there's a lot of gratification at the end of it because there's so much work and detail in the rock. Um, it's bigger materials, bigger rocks, sm really small rocks that you juxtapose to those. And it, it's an opportunity to build a, a broader, vision of the undersea world if you will so I, I i like the larger ones and again thinking out loud here you know it, i envision it when i'm building these things it's almost like if you had a, a mask on you were under the water looking at the seabed that's what i try to replicate um it's different with the smaller ones the smaller ones are really a lot of people say things like they're cute and they put them on their shelf in a little special spot they're less a piece of the big ones are almost like a piece of furniture. They're, you know, almost a hundred pounds, some of them. So they're very wow. substantive and um, you move them and you have a spot for them in mind. And that's where they usually reside for a long time. The other ones can roam around a counter, sit in a windowsill. Things like that. Well, obviously uh, everyone, uh, some of the people here are liking your art as much as me. We already have people saying, where can I get it? Do you showcase in local markets? Is there a place where they can purchase it? Um, I direct to me actually is where, how I go. It's a lot of it, uh, thus far for the last couple of years has been word of mouth. Um, for example, I uh, had a, a former colleague who built a, a new house here in Victoria and they, they literally had a landing that they built for this piece of seed that I made. It was, it was a huge piece and it turned out really well. I was very pleased with it, but, um, yeah, I, if people are interested there are more at the my Instagram page has my contact information on it. And uh, I'm always willing to discuss things like in terms of vision and such. Beautiful. We've popped your Instagram information into the chat. Um, have you worked with any other species? No, or is that, okay. I haven't. Um, I have okay. a few ideas about, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I have a few ideas about integrating, uh, not mediums, but 
actual living plants into some of them um, that I'm working with right now. It's a bit of a trial and error concept, but uh, it's good to have a secondary vision. Okay. Do you eat seaweed? Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. It's my kids, though. Wonderful. Okay. Let's look for some others here. Um, has anything changed in the way you create your art now from when you first started six years ago? Absolutely. Um, I want to say the joy is in the journey, and it is, but there's a lot of trial and error, especially in the early when I was first starting to do this. Because as you can imagine, the ceramics are of different resiliency and strength and material. So if early on, I didn't have a lot of sensibility about what, what a strong ceramic shape or material was. And that would make a difference because a lot of them would crack in the development phase. So that there was a lot of growing pains there. And I think I've refined it now. You know, I, I used to have a ratio, I'd say one in 10 cracked. And that's, that's good right now, but um, you know, it was probably one in three previously. But so it's a lot of work and then to have them sort of not be feasible at the end. Wow. Okay. Um, is there an average price point for your pieces? Um, little ones, like you can see this one behind me, that's about $40. And I kind of price them to reflect the time. Um, you know, and I also, I like them to have a good home. Um, the larger ones, I, this is, would be a small to medium sized one. That would be about a hundred dollars. And I can just take it off here and show you if it can. This is helpful or not, but if you look closely, you can see there's a lot of detail. I don't know if that's coming through very well, but there's a lot of detail in there. And this is heavy. You wouldn't want to drop it on your foot. <laughs> Probably about 30 pounds. So they're meant to, uh, like I said earlier, find a home and stay in a home. Um, but then I have... Unfortunately, I can't show you the large ones I have. The camera doesn't facilitate it right now, but uh, I, again, I really enjoy the large ones. Um, people really get inspired by them in particular uh, as parts of their home, their household, their furniture. Okay, and there, here's an interesting question. Is there any kind of seaweed smell to the art? No, there isn't actually. They're completely innocuous that way. Okay, and here's another, I, th I find this interesting as well. Do you work with the natural shape of the walking stick kelp or do you manipulate it or shape it in any way? No, that's a really good question. And thanks for asking that. It actually, the beautiful thing about this and this, you know, stepping back and talking about inspiration, if you will, is that it does come in all these different shapes and they're all unique. Every one is unique. And that's part of the the fun, I guess, if you will, and the, again, the inspiration is that integrating them into a single concept because they're all individual pieces is a challenge to make them look as one in a sort of natural context. So um, I think you can see this one, but this has, a, each of those is an individual piece and they all are individually placed in this, uh, in this piece itself. So. I don't know if you can see that, I hope so. But again, we talk about a vision and I will sit down and look at all of these various shapes of seaweed and sizes and start to conceptualize how they might look in the individual ceramic. So it's, initially it felt like algebra to me, to be honest with you, but uh, I think I hit my stride. Wow. Now here's um, another question. Uh, how long do the pieces last? Oh, unless um, they fall over and crack, which is, I've never had happen uh, perpetually. Okay, okay. Again, very substantive and strong. Right, okay. And in your favorite piece that is your favorite piece, what is it about it that makes it your favorite? Uh, well, I think it's the way, and again, we go come back to inspiration again. To me, the shape of this one in particular really captured that intertidal flow and, and the pull of, of the sea and at the same time being rooted and fastened. It, it kind of caught that juxtaposition of nature being fluid, but also being eternal, if, if that makes any sense. So I, I again, I, that inspiration really 
stuck with me in terms of how I build the, the ones going forward since that one initially was created. Oh, thank you. Do you ever name your art pieces? Uh, affectionately, I think I do sometimes. Um, my kids definitely do. And uh, they call this one witch hair. <laughs> so I don't know. I thought that was kind of cute, but, um, and I sort of see it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I don't, I let people interpret them as they will. Okay. Uh, someone's already ready to make a purchase, Rob. They want to know if you ship across the country or internationally. You know, I'd love to talk about that actually, because um, I, I've had a couple inquiries in that sense. And the challenge is the material. I think it depends on the concept in mind and how it's built. You know, if I build it with shipping in mind, it's a different product. Right. Um, absolutely. I'm going to think about those things. Okay. How about this one? Do you listen to music while you're creating? And if so, what do you listen to? Rachmaninoff. Oh. Yeah. I just put it on YouTube music and let it play anything from his repertoire. And I find that inspiring. How about this one? Where do you create your mute or sorry, where do you create your art? What sort of atmosphere do you like to work in? Are you by the water outside in the studio? Unfortunately, I, I don't want to say unfortunately, I have to do it. Uh, I have to be very prepared. So it really requires a controlled environment. I'd love to build them outside on, you know, on a picnic table with the wind blowing and stuff, which would be ideal. And I often do that when I visit my parents because I'll take my materials up there and they have a great outdoor space and workshop and uh, it, it's really conducive to it. But overall, I, I, I really have to pick my spots in terms of where I create it. And I have to do it in a way that I'm not distracted because there's a lot of key stages in the process where between drying and, you know, not painting, but putting the, the coating on that gives it the sheen and then repositioning. It's, it's really a, time sensitive and um, material sensitive process. Can you, I'm not sure if you said this in the video, but can you give us a sense of how long it takes to make a piece? Like if you were to speak to the pieces behind you, how long, what, how many hours are you talking? This, it, you, there's a, a big part of that time is drying time. Right. And that, uh, so this would take me half a day, maybe a full day, depending on the level of complication in the actual, um, detail so you can see there's seashells in there yeah and such and there's a lot of you have to do a lot of care in terms of uh, make, positioning the rocks I find that's really important particularly with, with the aesthetic I'd like it to be um, show again what it looks like when you're actually you have a mask on and you're looking at the seabed that's important to me um, so hence things like the, again this the seashells and things like that Okay. Do you ever get creatively frustrated? And if you do, how do you overcome it? Well, I love these questions. These are good. Yeah, I appreciate these. They're really good. Um, creatively frustrated. I'll tell you about this. It's when you finish a piece and it's taken all day and you're laying in bed and it's middle of night and you hear it crack. And again, there's that one in 10 or whatever. And that's the challenge sometimes. I mean, it is what it is. I guess that's part of the art in some ways is the art of, you know, making it successful. So. Wow. Okay. Now I know you said before that this is the only type of seaweed that you work with, but I have a question asking, do you work with other mediums? Do you do other kinds of art um, or is this your thing? This is really my thing. Um, I've done other art in the past, uh, but this mixed media is really inspiring to me because Again, getting back to that earlier question, I can make pieces that reflect other people's interests and sort of visions. And I, I really feel like I enjoy interpreting what other people see as being something that they find aesthetically pleasing. So it, it's a bit of an interpersonal exercise in some ways. Um, you know, I make them for myself obviously too, but um, I really like seeing other people's visions come to form. Uh, how about COVID? Has that affected your work at all and your art? Well, I tell you, I make a lot more of them now. So it's, uh, it's not a lot of options in terms of uh, other activities. And to be honest with you, I, my internal compass guides me to just, I, I really get a sense of peace and uh, enjoyment and fulfillment in doing these. And uh, again, it's time well spent in every regard. Beautiful. 
Have you uh, thought about teaching and in relation to teaching, do you teach classes and are you open to one-on-one -on -one teaching? We have some aspiring artists. Yeah, I'm absolutely open to that. Um, you know, I love conveying the, the experience and how you, know, you talk about individualization of the pieces themselves. I, it inspires me to think that other people could um, learn how to create their own vision and actualize it. So I do appreciate that for sure. And how about this one? Oh. You answer your other question. Um, yeah. I haven't taught any classes per se. Um, okay. Formally, I think my children could probably throw one together. I don't know how it would look at the end, but uh, they would know the steps. That's for sure. And yeah. You know. Okay. How about this one? Um, any advice for others looking to find inspiration in seaweed art? Inspiration, again, inspiration is such a wonderful concept. Um, so subjective. And in my perspective, I think it's about spending the time realize or going through what your vision is and what it means, you know, coming up with a concept, however uh, simple it might seem in some ways to you, to you as an individual, but spending the time in your mind with the concept so that you understand where and where you're going with it and what it might, um, what it ideally looks like and being willing to adapt to that vision as it, as it challenges you through the build. Have you ever painted the kelp or is everything natural or, or natural, I guess? Yeah, uh, no, I never, I've never had to paint it. I did one, sorry, I did do one where I, I painted it. Just, it, it didn't turn out quite the way I wanted and I didn't want to discard it. It was just early in the my days. And I did paint it and it looked pretty good. It's a bit more modernist than, um, than a natural West Coast ocean aesthetic. So it was neat and uh, it did find a good home. And uh, I would almost say it was more of an urban piece. It was, it was really neat actually, now that I think of it. Okay. A big part of this is the notch, bringing out the natural um, dynamics, like again, the vision, but also, you know, it's like, putting oil on a great piece of wood in some ways, it brings out what's already in inherent to it. Right. Now I have to say, this is a, an interesting question here because when I first started talking to you and we talked about being part of the seaweed um, days festival, I didn't know anything about walking stick um, about kelp art. And I didn't, I had never seen it before. So this really was the, was an introduction for me to the first time I'd ever seen these types of pieces. So I have someone asking, are there galleries or places where you can view this type of work? And I think you were mentioning earlier about a gallery. Um, to, to be honest with you, I, I know that it's, I, you know, through my sleuthing on the internet, I've seen it used in um, things like, I, and I believe this is in my video, um, baskets and such. So I, but I'll be honest with you, I don't know how you acquire it and manipulate it in a way that you could have it have an actual intentional form. And as you know, with mine, mine is individual pieces brought together in their own state already. So right. I think there's a lot of potential there um, for, to be creative, just like anything, um, any medium. Okay, wonderful. Do you envision using your pieces to inspire climate activists or environmental activism? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I think, again, this is part of that journey. And it, I get that out of the harvesting process and spending time by the ocean and just being in the moment and allowing that to sort of actualize my ideas. Um, and I think if it can, anything that can inspire someone to be reflective about and humble, frankly, about their environment, their natural setting and the forces that are around us, the power of the ocean in this instance, that's, uh, if you can mind that and make it a concept in your own mind through whatever form, I think that's valuable time. What's the most surprising thing in terms of the medium that you're using and walking stick cap art? Surprising? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, well, I'm always surprised when I'm collecting it by the form, the shape. They're all different, like really different. And you'll see there, some are completely straight. Others are have five stems and they go in every direction. So yeah, I think that's where how I would answer that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it totally does. Have you ever started a project and then changed direction? Yes, uh, I changed direction by necessity because of um, 
the timing, I have to, there's a lot big timing factor with placing the seaweed and having it hardened because once it's in, it's, it's there. So there's a fine point in time. Um, and sorry, can you repeat the, the question again? I want to make sure I answer it accurately. Uh, and now it's gone for me because it was my own question actually. And it just left my brain because I'm looking at all the other questions. Maybe, maybe one of my colleagues will jump in and remind me of what I just asked you. I'm so intrigued by the art and all the questions. I, I forgot my own question. Oh, have you ever, thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Have you ever started a piece and changed direction? Yes, I have. Um, you said by necessity. By necessity, absolutely. But also, um, you know, I'll, I'll be building one and I'll, I'll start thinking, you know, this needs a bit more of a different tone with the rocks and how it integrates with the color and the shape of the ceramic. That, that, it's a very subjective thing. And again, I think this gets back to what I say when I like working with people who have a vision and sort of mining that vision, pulling the, the essential pieces of their concept out so that I can interpret it accurately. And so to, so going along a little bit with that question, have you ever abandoned a piece? Uh, yeah, I have absolutely. And they end up staying in my house, <laughs> but I never really abandon them. I always try to take them all as, you know, some learning or in one form or another and uh, be it about the process or about the actual aesthetic, about the, how the seaweed is formed and laid, laid out. So someone's asking again, what's the name of the species that it's we're talking about today? Pterogophorica californica. Okay. If there's any... Californica. If there's anyone from Cascadia who can spell that for us and put that in the chat, that oh, there we go. That would be great. Okay. And what part of the seaweed are you using? Is it is it the entire piece that you're that you're foraging and gathering? Or well, they come in a certain form. So this would be an entire piece right here. Sorry. Okay. Um, so they're already oh, wow. kind of pre. I sometimes have to break parts off if if they're very oddly shaped, but they kind of give you what they are, so. Okay, one of our uh, one of our science colleagues is saying it looks like the stipe. I guess that's the that part of sense, the, yes. yeah, part of the, uh, part of the seaweed, okay. Okay, if we have, um, I think I've asked all the questions so far, right? Um, so feel free to pop more questions in there if you like. Um, one of one of the uh, people who's with us today, Karen, is saying, I weave with every part of bowl kelp, but had never heard of walking stick, ca stick kelp. And thank you for sharing your story and your beautiful art, Rob. Mm -hmm. And then someone else from our Cascadia group is saying, it's also known as old growth kelp and can live up to 25 years. I think that's where it gets its res resiliency from in some ways, because it, it is, um, and sorry to interrupt, one of the things that I noticed about it, that people are always surprised at how strong it is it's literally like a branch on a tree so i think 25 wow. years of growth probably necessitates that le level of structure i would think so too and jordan's just adding to that and saying that it even has growth rings like a tree it's fascinating I'll yeah tell you, when i um sometimes i have to use a, a saw to cut them in a certain way and it goes through the saw blades pretty quick because it's so it's such a dense material it's it's very interesting stuff it's a hardwood essentially uh, here's a question for you. How long does it take to dry it? Um, depending on the size of the piece entirely. Uh, I, I finished one yesterday and it's a big one and it's, it probably has three more days of drying. Wow. Okay. And um, I'm just interested in this and I don't know if you'll know the answer or if our science folks on here will have the answer, but are there certain parts of the world where you find walking stick kelp as opposed to other parts of the world where there isn't? Like I have not seen it before, but maybe I just haven't noticed it or been looking, but are there parts of the world where it's... My understanding is it's a Northern Pacific species. And I honestly can't say with respect to the Atlantic or other oceans, but my sense is that it's um, very locally abundant. So I'll find it in certain places on the coast here. And then there'll be like 50 mile stretches where I'd never see a piece of it. it it's interesting that way. Wow. As to the okay. specialization of the, the species, I think. Yeah. So um, our science folks are chiming in saying that it is um, definitely a North Pacific seaweed for sure. 
Oh, and someone, uh, oh, and, and you may notice it now, and no, uh, you'll notice it now. I think they're writing this for me, and I won't think of it as a stick anymore or mistake it for a stick, right? So I'm definitely going to go and look for it now. I live in the, uh, an area uh, not far from you, so I'm definitely going to go and look for it now because I definitely hadn't seen it before, and it's really amazing to me and so beautiful, yeah. and I would never have thought of it in, in this way at all. So I think you're creating really beautiful pieces. Oh, thank you so much. Really lovely. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. Is there anything else that we should know about the work that you do or the, the art that you create, the inspiration? No, I, again, I'm stepping back to what you've mentioned earlier. I, I, I really enjoy working with people's concepts. I, I've done a few of them for um, bed and breakfast, which the people who typically have those operations have the, a really distinct vision of what they, what they feel is their brand, if you will, as a, as a service provider. And, it's, I like interpreting that and in the same way if someone had a residence, you know, you, you want it to be reflective and not look um, unwelcome in your home. So it, there's that integration, that symbiotic aspect that I think is really, really inspiring for me anyways. And I think it is for the people who sort of have the end product. And the thing too about it that's really lovely to me is that it's all unique and every single, there is absolutely no piece that will ever look like another piece. That's right. Right. So I love that it's all unique. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, I have to admit, like from my perspective, like in creating these, it's hard because they're, it, it does take time, as I mentioned, but you get attached to the pieces themselves and, uh, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I don't really want to get rid of this at the end of the day, but, you know, they always find a good home. What's the largest piece you've made? Well, um, this one I did the other day, it's still drying, is probably the largest, if not the most substantive. It's probably 100 pounds. In wow. It, it's got some serious mass to it. And it's probably four, three and a half, four feet tall. And it's taken you how long? Um, well, there was a lot of collecting because that, that particular uh piece required a lot of going to uh, locations to find long pieces of seaweed that are suitable for the actual vase itself. So that was a challenge. They're a bit more hard to come by. The little pieces are easy to find once you know where to get them. But uh, the, yeah, the biggest challenge is the timing. It's, it's just a real uh, being patient with it, which I really enjoy. But, you know, people want to see their vision to create it. So I like to explain that it's a journey. So I would think when someone comes to you um, to commission a piece, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell them how long it's going to take or when it'll be ready based on. Oh, do you know, honestly, it never takes me more than a couple of weeks. Okay. He is for people to, I, I think they get inspired knowing that they go and pick out a vase or some sort of ceramic themselves. Right. And I've had people pick brand new ones from a retailer or really get into the weeds, pardon the pun, and, and look around and find that unique piece at a, a, a flower shop or a secondhand store that really is meaningful to them. And that, however it comes to me, it, it, as long as it comes with a vision and something I can interpret, I can work with that absolutely. Beautiful. Someone's asking if, the, um, if there's gonna be a picture of that largest piece on Instagram. I did post one today. Is it there? Oh, yeah. you posted it today. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we can check it out. And we have someone else saying wonderful presentation and thanking you for it and asking, can you recommend a book to us? Not necessarily about seaweed, but even just inspirational or? You know, and I hope this is related. I, I'm a bit of a history um, buff, if you will. I, I, I get inspired and this is probably part of what got me to this place in my mind is the history of the First Nations on, on the island and in British Columbia, not just in coastal context, but also in the interior and their integration of natural phenomena and materials into day-to-day um, -day existence, really. And I, I think I've spoke about walking stick kelp being just one example of that. So any books that touch upon that history, um, I think of Jean Barman's The West Beyond the West. It's a very academic book, but it talks about the, the contact between um, Europeans and other sort of cultures meeting traditional cultures here and 
having that humility to be able to learn from have a, an information exchange, an energy exchange, um, a knowledge exchange with other peoples. Thank you. This is a question that um, uh, musicians often often get asked, you know, what's the song they haven't written? Is there a piece or something that you have a vision for that you haven't created yet? Something in the future that you're looking forward to doing or something you've thought of that you thought, well, I'd like to. Yeah, you know, um, again, a lot of these are made for homes internally, like for inside the house. They have enough resiliency, particularly if I build them in a certain way, that they could be almost part of a, an outdoor landscape. And you know that people spend so much time outdoors in their yards and their their special settings that they call their own. And I'd like to work with concepts where I can complement that environment, that setting that they have. So that typically involves a bigger piece, and I've done a couple of them, but I really get uh, a lot out of. I think it's the, just the outdoors and home for them, if you will. And I think in addition to outdoors, I think it would be lovely to have some public uh, arts, uh, your art in public spaces. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be beautiful to sit and reflect on a piece of that art, you know, up close and personal in an outside setting? I think it would be amazing. Yes, I, I agree. I, I would look forward to that. Absolutely. Perhaps we'll start a campaign. A campaign. Yes. yes <laughs> to have you commissioned to do Good a piece. Idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I don't see too many. I think you've answered all the questions that certainly you've answered all of mine and all of the questions that we've popped in um, the chat. We popped in the book that you just talked about your inspiration. We've popped in your Instagram. And I think um, you're going to see now the emails coming in asking you to teach and the one-on-one -on -one and that sort of thing. And um, uh, I think we'll have a lot more people asking about your art. So I would love for me personally, and also for our audience, I would love to thank you for the time today. I really am inspired. I I never knew anything about this type of art. It's absolutely spectacular what you're creating. And uh, I think it's um, a really beautiful gift. And I'm, and I'm glad that you found it. Since it's not your day job, I am definitely glad that you found it. It's definitely a gift for all of us to see your beautiful work. Thank you. Well, I, yeah. I'm, I'm humbled and I'm very grateful, not only for this opportunity, but uh, for people's time and for the lovely feedback. It's very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad you were part of CW Days. Everybody, you can continue to check out Rob's work on, on um, Instagram. And yeah, thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon. And we'll look forward to seeing you all at our next CW session. Take good care, everybody. Thank thanks, Rob. Thanks so much. Yeah.